on this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. It's the What The Ship edition, top five maritime stories for March 15th, 2022. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCaglan, and welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, the What The Ship edition, where we talk about top five stories in maritime news. If you're new to the channel and you haven't done so yet, please subscribe, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos when they come out, and be sure to leave a comment or a thumbs up and share it across social media. So, March 15, 2022, man, a lot of shipping stuff going on. I mean, there's a lot of ship to talk about. So let's go ahead and jump right into them with story number one. So story number one brings us back to Russia and Ukraine. And again, we're going to keep updating this story because this has global implications. I know for many people that what's going on in Russia and Ukraine is obviously horrendous. And, and we're seeing the continue events befall Ukraine. But understand there is a larger global implication here, and that is the global supply chain. We've already had constraints in the global supply chain going on for two years now, and we're going to talk about some new issues with it. But Russia, Ukraine has it on several levels. And I just want to highlight several stories here to demonstrate why we should be concerned about what's going on there. Number one, Bloomberg's story on G Captain. Russia's invasion of Ukraine threatens the already fragile global food system. Again, 10% of the world's grain comes out of Russia. 9% comes out, excuse me, 10% comes out of Ukraine. 9% comes out of Russia. This is all absolutely vital that this food supply is maintained. Nothing is coming out of Ukraine right now. And what that means, as the story implicates here, is the potential for food inflation, uh, cost to go up. They talk about food protectionism, talk about farm inputs. Uh, and the Black Sea supplies and the literal buying frenzy that we're seeing right now in the commodities market on these topics. And the issue of food is going to be absolutely essential going forward. So food supply right off the very bat is a big one. Now, United States, you're not going to run out of food in the United States. Let's be clear. We're pretty well food self-sufficient. However, our demand to export food is going to increase. And we'll talk about that issue in a second. But that could mean higher food costs across the world and even in the United States as demand for our food to be exported goes up. Other stories, this one from Lloyd's List, Russia resumes commercial trade in the Sea of Azov. So we've been following this. This is marine traffic. It shows you all commercial vessels that are squawking AIS, the automated information system. Up here in the Gulf of Odessa, we're not seeing a lot right here. Uh, we're seeing some vessels uh, being shown up here, but not a lot. We know there's a naval force, Russian naval force, demonstrating off Odessa right now. Uh, we know that there are right here on the Sea of Azov, Ostov. While we're not seeing any vessels squawking on the Sea of Azov, we know it's open now. Uh, we've seen Russian vessels steaming here into this port, and we know Mariupol is uh, suffering uh, and been besieged for quite a long time. And so now we know that the vessels are moving. We see this here with the IMO calling for maritime safe corridors to evacuate ships stranded by the Ukrainian conflict. Many vessels, and we saw last week, Bangladesh vessel get hit and a Bangladesh third engineer killed on board. The IMO is calling for these safe corridors. I don't think it's gonna happen for the vessels. The Ukrainians have mined the waters. The Russians are very unlikely to let these vessels out right now. Subsequent story, one in five Ukrainian seafarers want to return home to fight. Ukrainians make up about 5% of the world's seafarers. You're talking about losing 1% of the world's seafarers right now to head back home to fight. Uh, big issue if all of a sudden there's insufficient mariners on board vessels to sail. We talked about the container liners self-sanctioning Russia, cutting them out. However, this story by Reuters talks about the fact that Maersk is heading back to go grab empty containers. Uh, they want to grab them. Uh, the article right here says, we have about 50,000 of our containers in Russia today. Most of them are empty. They are our property. This is Soren Sku, the chief executive for Maersk. So it makes it very interesting here that Maersk talks about cutting out Russia, yet they're putting their priority to get their empty containers back. Story here from John Conrad, Ukraine war, where is the U.S. Navy? Uh, a lot of talk right now starting to come up about blockading Russia, and I can't tell you how dangerous of a perspective that is. Uh, I have talked about the idea that there should be a naval presence up in the Black Sea to defend commercial vessels. Uh, blockade is a whole different issue. If you start blockading ports and preventing the flow, you know, go back here again to marine traffic, 
the port right here, Navarosk, is busy port right now. You're seeing vessels move. Not as much oil as before, but a lot of grain ships coming out. Same thing right here coming out of the Kerch Strait, seeing a lot of grain vessels coming out. And if we start talking about a blockade, well, that's going to be a whole different issue. This story here about the Russian naval blockade may starve millions. This goes back to the wheat issue that we talked about with Ukraine. Will the Russian tanker fleet come to a halt? Big question. A lot of sanctions right now against the Russian tanker fleet. We saw crude oil go over $100 a barrel. It's back down again, but this is creating volatility in the oil market. And you have right here a story out of Lloyd's list that Shell and Maersk tankers are still shipping Russia cargoes. And, and again, we, we're talking about these boycotts not doing this, yet we're seeing that there's still some trade going on here below the surf surface. The question is, who's buying the oil? Uh, port risk and war risk insurance is reaching high levels. The level of concern, especially in the Black Sea, is raising, which is going to cause companies who have to get war risk insurance, makes it more expensive to operate. Most insurance is a fraction of a percentage point. You, you don't pay that much on insurance on a vessel. But if you talk, start talking about war risk insurance, you're talking about three, five, eight percent of the value of the vessel and cargo. That's a lot of money right there. And so this idea of war risks spreading is going to be a big issue. And then the other issue we see here is fuel spikes. We're talking about fuel spiking to over $1,000 a ton. This means that's gonna be more expensive to move vessels around. That is going to be a major issue. And then last, I wanna add you, leave you with this opinion piece, which I found really interesting on uh, Maritime Executive. Russia's Arctic gas is funding the war in Ukraine. Uh, the purchase of gas, particularly uh, LNG and uh, oil and diesel fuel, from the Russians is what the Russians are using to fund this war. And as long as we find ourselves taking this oil and this gas, it's gonna cross Ukraine is still in service, pumping oil to Europe during the midst of this war. You would think Ukraine would cut this line, but uh, they haven't done it. And I think it's one of the access of advances we've been seeing for the Russians is to grab it. So a lot going on with Russia, Ukraine, need to keep it on the radar because of its global implications. That's story number one. Story number two, she's back. Again, an evergreen container ship has gone aground. Uh, not new. We're literally almost a year from the anniversary of Ever Given going sideways in the Suez Canal. But in this case, we saw a evergreen vessel, not the Ever Given, but this time the Ever Forward, run herself aground coming out of Baltimore and heading southbound into Norfolk. And this story, I did an entire video on it. You can go check it out right here. Uh, that was my first take on this. Uh, we've seen a little bit more develop here in this story. Uh, the vessel was southbound, heading uh, out of Baltimore, had a pilot on board, and she basically missed the turn coming southbound out of Baltimore. Uh, the story right here, this is the uh, Mike Schuller story. This is the original story here by uh, Mike Scholler with some add-ons to it. Let me show you just a little bit more on what's come out on this. This is the Twitter feed of uh, John Scott Railton. Uh, he is amazing to follow. I strongly recommend if you're on Twitter, you follow him. He does some of these great in-depth views on a myriad of different topics, but he started one on Error Forward yesterday and we kind of overlapped on, on, on some of the things uh, we talked about here, uh, he's got some great graphics. I just wanna show you some of them right here. This was the vessel heading south, 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 southeast, roughly out into the channel. And she was supposed to head south down into the Craig Hill channel. Now understand this vessel was one of the new Neo Panamax vessels. In other words, it can fit in the new lane of the, of the Panama Canal, roughly about 12,000 boxes on board she can carry. And, Baltimore has done an extensive amount of work to get vessels like this in their port. They expanded the depth of this channel from 38 feet to 50 feet. They brought in some new ship to shore cranes. Uh, and, and so vessels like Everforward are designed to go into ports like this. And matter of fact, she was on a Asia via the Panama Canal to the East Coast, going to Savannah, Baltimore, Norfolk, New York, and then back out again. So she was probably about half full, half empty, even though she's full of boxes, but probably about half the boxes were empty, maybe 60, 40 full versus empty. 
Uh, she's coming into this turn here, and you'll notice it's wide here in this turn so that vessels can make the wide turn here and then head southbound. She never seemed to go make that turn. She completely blew past, which is hard to believe, again, because you have these buoys, these green red buoys that mark the periphery of the channel, red on right returning. And she blew right between the two green and red buoys here and then into the spoil area right down here. And she draws 42 feet of water and she's now in water 24 feet deep. Uh, she is stuck, stuck. I, I mean, she's stuck good. Uh, it's going to be a lot to have to pull her out. I understand dragging her out stern first is going to be a big problem because of the prop and the rudders will pile mud up behind the vessel. You're either going to have to dredge out around her. It's going to be really hard to lighten this vessel because all you can take off is really fuel. It's going to be hard to get the container boxes off of her. This is a mess. She is stuck. Now, the only good thing in this situation is nobody got hurt. There's been no release of fuel. We don't think the, da the hull's damaged because she did run aground on mud. However, she is uh, just out of the channel, which is good. So we still have traffic going up to Baltimore. So we, we still see a lot. The question is why this happened. There's a pilot on board, Chesapeake Bay pilot. Pilots know these waters back and forth. You know, they're giving tests, blank maps, charts, and have to fill in the details. Uh, this is well lit, well lit. It wasn't heavy winds or anything like that. No reduced visibility doing this. So it's not exactly clear what happened here. Now, I, I've been on a ship at night. You can lose depth perception. You can lose orientation fairly easily. But you have a pilot. You have a master. You have a mate on watch. There's a lot of redundancy up on this bridge right here. And, and again, this is not just on the pilot. This is on the ship's master, too, for missing this channel. There is no reason. And it doesn't look like she made any turn whatsoever until the very end. Uh, this is her in a little bit more detail here where she's stuck. This is a lot of the dredge area that's taken out of the channel and dumped there. So it's good soft mud. Hopefully they'll be able to get her out. The problem is there's almost no tide here, only about a foot tide in this area, even with the full moon coming on. So it's going to be really, really difficult to get her out. And uh, we will not get any information really till the investigation is done. All the material is recorded by the vessel data recorder, but that doesn't become public access until after given is heading northbound in the Suez Canal today. So <laughs> just, just a lot going on. And that wasn't the only grounding, by the way. We have this event, a Norwegian uh, cruise liner. In this case, the Norwegian Escape was heading northbound out of Puerto Plata on the Dominican Republic when she hit high winds coming out and ran aground. Uh, she ran aground. She had a pilot on board. Uh, she was not able to avoid being pushed to the west and coming aground. Fortunately, when the tide came in, the tugs were able to pull her free, and she is now pierside in Puerto Plata. She probably will have to be inspected by DNV, the classification agency, before she's permitted to sail on her remaining voyage. I think her calls at St. Thomas and in the Bahamas are going to be canceled. Uh, not sure how long it'll take for her to be cleared from there. And again, these things come in threes. The other day, a drill ship broke its moorings and collided with a bulk carrier in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Uh, this vessel, which is a huge vessel, you can see the size of the drill ship here, broke free from her moorings and came down on top of the bulk ship. Not sure about the extent of damage here. But again, this happens in shipping. You hear about it more because of the internet and people like me who have a YouTube show who can bring it to you and people filming these things. But the Ever Forward is going to be an ongoing event. Fortunately, unlike Ever Given, she's not blocking a, a, a channel, but also unlike Ever Given, she's not just hung up on a bow and stern. This vessel has run up on a bank and that's going to be an extensive operation to get her off. Don't expect to see her off anytime quickly. You have to worry about pollution. You have to worry about damage to the vessel. This is gonna be a, a a process here to get her off. That was story number three. Story number three brings us to Asia and in particularly the outbreak of COVID. Uh, we are in the United States experiencing this downturn. It's great. Uh, at my university, Campbell, we've gone mask optional, so it's fantastic. However, one of the things we're seeing is COVID's not over around the world, and we're seeing that right now. This Lorianne Laraco story on freight waves. Logistic companies warn clients shut down in Shenzhen will impact port activity. This is the third largest port in the world. This is the area around Hong Kong. And we're seeing right now shutdowns taking place in the ports 
and uh, lockdowns. And again, China's response to COVID is to shut down and lock everything down for two weeks. Uh, this is their zero COVID policy. Uh, we've seen it in Yantian. We've seen it in several ports throughout China when this happens. And what you see is a little shutdown. You'll see right here, this massive shutdown that happened at Yantian when it happens. We don't know if this is going to happen in Shenzhen yet. We don't know the impact it's going to have, but we know it is going to have an impact. Uh, Reuters story here, as China's COVID curbs hit the supply chain, Understand we're just coming out of the Chinese New Year, so there is a tsunami of, of, of containers and boxes heading across to the United States, which we'll talk about in a minute. But now you may see a disruption in that coming down. So th this can allow the US to catch up in some ways, but I'll talk about some of the issues regarding that in a minute. Uh, Sam Chambers over at Splash 24 seven, ship queues lengthen in major Chinese ports as COVID case escalate. They're not loading ships as fast that means we're going to see a slowdown in goods coming out of Asia. Understand Asia is the major hub for goods coming out around the world and also imports too. A lot of imports come into China too. We forget that, but it does. And what does that mean? Container rates climb on these lockdowns. We're seeing this happen. So we're seeing these escalation of freight rates. All this means uncertainty in the market. We kept talking about, you hear it a lot in the mainstream media. Hey, we're catching up. Everything's returning back to normal in the, in the freight ways, especially when it comes to container shipping. Uh, not 100% sure that is true, I would argue. I think one of the things we're seeing is these continual disruptions in the supply chain are resonating down the entire chain. And again, a chain is a terrible phrase. It should be more like a web, the supply web because they're all interrelated. And when you affect one, you affect the other. All right, let's go to story number four. Story number four is a situation in the United States. What's going on with ports in the United States? And one of the things we're seeing is a lot of records being broken in US ports early in 2022. This story from Mike Schiller, Port of Long Beach reports record February amid efforts to clear the docks. Uh, they were able to move 796,000 TEUs in February. That's up 3.2% from the same month last year. A lot of that has to do with the opening fully of the LBCT terminal and the fact that Long Beach has really proven itself to be a rival for LA in its movement of cargo. They are moving a great deal off the docks. The other element we're seeing here is that ports of LA and Long Beach have been really been able to start reducing the backlog, both in containers in the terminal and the vessels off the port, which I'll talk about in a second. But this also has a lot to do with the fact that cargo is moving. It's not just coming into LA and Long Beach anymore. Carriers are finding out that the shippers, the people who want their cargo are going to alternative ports. Think about Everforward, coming through the Panama Canal to go to the four ports on the East Coast. We're seeing more and more of that. And these stories kind of play into this. This is Joanna Marsh's story in Freight Waves, February, another record busting month for South Carolina ports. Talking about Charleston right here, loaded imports up 46%, but exports down nearly 19%. Even the port of Boston, which has suffered quite a lot here, they've been basically blanked a lot by carriers not coming in. They're getting some new connections, and particularly they're opening up a very unique service this time to Vietnam. Uh, this is going to be uh, an interesting one where we're seeing some carriers come into smaller ports to provide service. In this case, Zim. Zim's going to come in and do that. And we also see the Georgia ports. Uh, paving way for more vehicles at the port of Brunswick. Brunswick, which was the site of the uh, very infamous vessel sinking we saw back in 2019 with the Golden Ray. They've got a $150 million project there that's going to allow to handle them an additional 200,000 more autos annually through the port. And again, we're, we're talking about containers, we're talking about autos, and not to be outdone here, the Port of Miami announced a, a big uh, issue here to kick off a new cruise ship terminal to handle more of the cruise ships coming out of Miami. So all this means that we're seeing a lot of infrastructure uh, investments in the ports. We're also seeing the ports do a lot more. But understand, there is a narrative going on that you need to be clear about. Let's talk about that for a second. Port of LA and Long Beach. So the Port of LA and Long Beach have been talking about the fact that they're clearing the backlog in particularly the number of vessels waiting to get in have decreased. And they have, let's be 
They have. Used to be when you zoom out here off the port of LA and Long Beach, there were huge numbers of ships off the coast. Now, let me be clear too. They have moved those vessels. They're still there. They're just not right there off Southern California. They're here off Baja. Uh, they basically just moved them south. So now they're sitting off Baja, California, out of sight, out of mind, and dumping pollution on Mexico, not Southern California voters. But we still have a lot of ships off the port. This is the Marine Exchanges site. And the Marine Exchange of Southern California, which does the port of LA, Long Beach, and a few others, tracks vessels coming in. Their latest number of ships at Loiter and at Anchor are 43. Now that is down a substantial number. Again, we were at a peak of over 100. And matter of fact, if you go to their chart on that, here you go. You can see their chart on that when it was peaking way back in uh, the end of last year, beginning of this year. So they're way down. It, it, it is way down. We've seen that come down a lot. But understand, 40 is still a lot. I mean, we had that point here in early of 2021 here or mid 2021. And again, in early, uh, late 2020, early 2021. So we're still at a huge level. Again, we're not at 100 ships, but 40 is still 4,000% more than there usually is. So it's, it's a lot, but the big thing you have to look at, they're not counting in these numbers or these chain of ships coming across. And again, there's a tsunami of vessels on the way. There's a lot of vessels coming across to the port of LA and Long Beach. Now, does that mean we're gonna get back to hundred vessels off the port? I don't know. Understand there's two issues at play here. Number one, the ILWU, the West Coast Longshoremen are up for a contract renegotiation. Their contract expires June 30th. And so a lot of shippers, people who are having their cargo ship, will want to get their cargo over early in case there's a shutdown, a slowdown, or potentially a strike on the West Coast. The other issue is they're shifting their cargo to other ports, particularly on the Gulf and East Coast. Again, think ever forward. Let's go back to marine traffic for a second. That's LA and Long Beach. You see LA and Long Beach all the time. Let's look at some other ports here. Let's go up the coast to the port of Oakland. Oakland, which had been bypassed for a long time, is back in operation. But you'll see here, anchored in San Francisco Bay, a line waiting to get into Oakland. As Oakland starts taking more ships now, they're back in service. They're seeing backups start to appear. Let's go up the coast to Seattle, Tacoma. Seattle, Tacoma, right up here. Now, these are also bulk ships, too. These are containers and bulk ships. So you see a lot of vessels coming in here. Port of Vancouver has a lot of vessels. They're still getting dealing with the backlog from when the port closed for about three weeks. But even in Seattle and Tacoma, we see ships at anchor here waiting to get in. So we have a slight backlog in Seattle, Tacoma. But where the backlog is materializing more so is on the East Coast. Let's go to New York, New Jersey. New York, New Jersey has been able to handle their container ships pretty well. They're, they're really a, a machine when it comes to this. However, they are starting to experience a slight delay with backlogs off the port of New York, New Jersey. Not substantial, nowhere near what we saw off LA, but they're seeing it. Let's go down here to Norfolk. Oh, sorry. So this is the port of Norfolk, Virginia. The round circles are anchors. The arrow ships are ships moving. This large concentration are bulk carriers. These are waiting to get up into the bulk facilities in Norfolk and up the Chesapeake Bay there uh, in, in Maryland. But here you see container ships waiting to get into the container terminal in Norfolk. And Norfolk is experiencing a backlog. If you head further south down the coast, Charleston and Savannah. Charleston has a huge backlog. They are into mid-April, if not May now, before they're going to clear this backlog that has hit them. Uh, Charleston basically advertised that they can handle a lot, and they got a lot of business, but now they're dealing with that backlog. Uh, they are not as well prepared as a port like Savannah, for example. Savannah has much better road, rail. They're right there on I-95, uh, I-16. They've got a, a plenty of land outside of Savannah to put, put warehouses and storage areas. Charleston is really constrained by the geography of Charleston. They also lack key rail, I would argue. And then the other port that's also should be resonating on everyone's mind here is the port of Houston. And right here at Houston, these are bulk carriers coming in, but these are container ships. And the port of Houston has also experienced a bit of a backlog. And what we're seeing is container where we saw that backlog just off LA and Long Beach, it has now moved. 
And so just because LA and Long Beach numbers are down, hey, we're down to 40, it's a success. Be careful about that. Because again, what we're gonna see is waves of ships coming over, especially if the ports in uh, Shenzhen shut down for a while. We were starting to see this wave come over, there may be a disruption in that wave. And then all of a sudden it creates it. What you want is this nice steady flow. You don't want pulses, you want, you want flow, not pulse. And that's what we tend to see. All right, next story. Story number five is always a story I like to talk about. I find it interesting. And so if you're watching What the Ship, this is always the one that kind of, for me, is, is the most interesting. And I want to focus on what's going on with the U.S. Merchant Marine in, in several ways. And I talked about this story a few episodes back where American Cruise Line is building a new class of 12 coastal cruise ships for the U.S. market. Again, the larger cruise lines are going to have an issue with getting people on board with, with you know, variations spiking up. But one of the things that we're seeing is in the coastal market, uh, coastal cruise ships are really seeing a boom. And American Cruise Lines, who I have worked for, let me be clear, I, I worked for them at, over the summer, I do a guest lecture tour on board their vessels. I haven't done it, uh, obviously, since COVID hit. But, you know, I'd go on a cruise with them for 10 days and give talks. But uh, they are seeing a, a birth. Uh, they're really building these new class of vessels, these catamarans, 12 vessels at their yard in Salisbury, Maryland. They're building it. We also see Edison Shawest just floated out a new Viking vessel for a new river cruise that's going to be happening. And, and again, the river cruises and you know, uh, coastal cruises are definitely on a, a rise within the United States. And we're seeing that happen. The other story I wanna read here is this one. The Mike Schuller story, the American maritime industry fights back against Jones Act misconceptions. So there is a full court press right now attacking the Jones Act, which is the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. And the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 aimed to provide a national maritime strategy. I have a video here that you can watch that talks about the history of that. Uh, but in this case, what's going on here is because fuel prices spiked and because we decided to sanction Russian oil, we now have to move oil around the United States. And understand the reason we were importing Russian oil is because we lack refineries. There hasn't been a new refinery built in the United States since 1977. So you have to move crude oil from where it's at to the refineries. The problem is crude oil tends not to go through the pipelines. If you know the colonial pipeline, for example, that moves refined products, not crude. And so you have to move it by tanker. Now, there is a fleet, roughly about 60 Jones Act tankers that can do this. They're American owned, American crewed, American built, and American flagged, which means they're more expensive than a foreign ship that's registered over in Panama or Liberia, crewed by Filipinos, Indonesians, Russians, Chinese, Indians, uh, which are, is incorporated overseas, doesn't meet the same standards as set by the United States, and their, corporate, their business is also offshore. So uh, they don't meet any of the American requirements. And understand these Jones Act tankers are really essential in case of war with the shutdown of the Red Hill facility. Just did a video on that if you want to go watch it. Now, all of a sudden, you have to have to have these Jones Act tankers, which can load refined product in case we need it in case of a war scenario, Russia, China, or whoever is out there. And there's a big attack against these right now. We're seeing a, a systematic pressure against this. Now, let me be clear. I, I think there needs to be reforms of the Jones Act. There needs to be. I don't think it needs to be repealed, however, and open ourselves up to foreign shipping to move our commerce. We're already seeing that. You just saw the president give a State of the Union address where he basically sat there and said, this is a problem. Don't do this because the rates go up. And I had a sit down talk with Lauren Began, where again, another video, where we went in detail talking about the power of the Federal Maritime Commission, the Department of Justice, and the container carriers and issues associated with them. This is a much more complex issue than what the opponents of the Jones Act would have you believe. They believe repeal the act solves the problem and gas prices will plummet. I don't think so. You're seeing huge freight costs by the carriers right now. You're seeing costs go up through the roof 
And more importantly, you're seeing low reliability. One of the things that Jones Act does is it ensures there's a fleet of U.S. flag tankers to handle the U.S. market. When all of a sudden ocean carriers go someplace else because it's more profitable for them, they could leave the U.S. without coverage. That's what literally created the Jones Act in 1920. And so this story is a really interesting one. I really recommend it uh, for you to take a look at. I hope you enjoyed this episode of What the Ship, because man, there's a lot of ship going on here. Uh, if you did, please subscribe, hit the bell so you be alerted about new videos when it comes out, share it across social media, leave a comment, and if you can, become a Patreon. A Patreon supports the page, allows me to have the time and effort to put in to do these videos, and more importantly, helps us expand the uh, channel and bring in more resources to make this channel even better. So I appreciate you taking the time. Until our next episode, Sal, signing off.